Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Stories from the Field, Oral Histories at Queen's Memory Project. I have just a few housekeeping notes to mention. Uh, one, if you have any sound or technical issues today, please let me know in the chat box with a direct message, and I'll do my best to help you out. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording, along with a PDF version of the slideshow, will be sent out to all registrants within the next week or so. And finally, we do have some built-in time at the end to answer any questions that may come up, but please feel free to type them into the chat box at any point throughout the presentation. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to share a little bit about the Documentary Heritage Preservation Services for New York. DIPSNY, as we like to call it, is a collaboration between the New York State Archives and the New York State Library with services provided by the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. DIPSNY is a statewide program that provides free planning and education services to support the vast network of collecting institutions, such as archives, libraries, historical societies, museums, and other organizations that safeguard and ensure access to New York's historical records and library research materials. DIPSNY services include archival needs assessments, preservation and condition surveys, strategic planning assistance, and access to a variety of educational programs, such as this webinar. To learn more about our services, please visit dhpsny.org. And with that, I pass this along to today's presenter, Natalie Milbrook, Director of Queen's Memory. Thank you so much, Leah. And big thanks to um, DIPSNY because um, the work that you're doing in the state is really so essential and helping a lot of us um, with our collections. So thanks for having us here. I'm really happy to be with all of you today and to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing in Queens, New York um, on the Queens Memory Project. So Queens Memory uh, is um, a community archiving program that's co-administered by Queens Public Library and by Queens College CUNY. And I'm the director. We have a small but mighty team. And um, I'm going to be talking today a little bit about um, the years uh, since our founding um, and also some of our philosophy behind Queens Memory. And this talk is really meant to be um, helpful to folks who are doing similar kind of work and facing some of the uh, same challenges that we probably are facing um, in our program. So um, with that, I'll, I'll just get started with an explanation of what we see as our twofold mission. So this is really what's behind Queen's Memory. The idea is that we are trying to push artifacts out to community members, make sure that people in Queens know about the local history collections that are in the repositories of their public library and at Queens College um, for them. And then while we're out with community, we try to encourage people to share their family stories with the our local history collections so that we're getting a really rich and diverse snapshot of life in the borough of Queens as it is today. Because what we know now is that people really come to us asking for what Queens was like maybe a hundred years ago uh, when their families were living here. And we know that in a hundred years, people will be very curious about 2022 and what the lives of people were like now. So we're trying to put things away for um, them being useful in the future. And I would say that because we're a community um, archiving program, the way we do that collecting is um, a little bit different than the way that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, old school um, archives from the um, 18th and 19th century would be doing it. So instead of just receiving things passively, we do try to go out and engage with community and engage people in history making with us. So it's a much more um, it's a much more kind of tactile uh, process than waiting for people who already know that their family story is important to come in with boxes of stuff that then we accept and process. So, um, and we also operate under um, what's called a post-custodial model, which is that we're not taking things that are physical donations from people, we are um, taking digital collections. So those are either um, primarily oral history interviews that we teach people how to create, or um, we do scanning and we keep the digital version and we send the um, physical version back with families and along with the digitized copies so that they have those things in their families' collections. 
So an important part of um, the way we think about engaging with community is this model that's, I think, just, you know, used by marketers and things. It's, it's the idea of having an engagement funnel. So, um, you know, I guess if you were a marketer, you'd be thinking about this in terms of like how to get somebody to buy your widget, right? But what we're trying to do is give people um, very... Uh, low barrier to entry um, to come to some of our programs, just as you see at the top of this funnel, just as an anonymous audience member, somebody who's just coming to one of our programs and maybe doesn't you know, need to really participate or share their name or anything about themselves. And then we um, try to invite people from there to um, maybe attend a story sharing event where they're maybe you know, sharing something about their family's history. And then um, you know, we continue to engage with people and give them opportunities to do things like uh, contribute an oral history interview that would be their life story, maybe interview somebody from their family or from their workplace or religious community or from their school, from their neighborhood uh, that they think is important and the person maybe needs to you know, be in the archives and they're not already. So um, it, it, it's most um, you know, entwined with us, uh, people become co-organizers of the Queen's Memory Project. And that's really something that we like to keep as an open invitation to any community member who wishes to be part of our team. And you can see here in this in this funnel, you know, some examples of programs that we do that are real like, you know, light touch kind of things like panel discussions that people can come and either watch online or, you know, show up to um, in person. And then, you know, maybe engaging in one of our trainings that we do with new volunteers. And then, you know, perhaps getting into teaching um, a lesson in a classroom where students over a semester will prepare and conduct interviews. Or, and then really like the most engaged people we call our ambassadors. So these are folks who are either staff members or um, community members who are really bringing Queen's memory into their communities and being ambassadors for the program um, to the people who they know and explaining, you know, the consent forms and how they work and explaining how, you know, how things are processed and how they're available to the public. So we try to, um, as much as possible, really give people who want to be in these roles really great information um, that they can share about how Queen's Memory works. So that's a bit about how um, we kind of think about engaging with the public and something that um, we try to do like when we're planning out a year of public programming is making sure that we have programs that are really at all levels of engagement um, at all times so that wherever somebody's comfortable, they can jump in and find something that sounds like a good, um, a good option for them. So this is a picture of one of the uh, one of our in-person events. We love doing in-person events. We have a lot of them at our um, 60 plus branch locations um, of the Queens Public Library, but we also have them at uh, community partner sites, historical societies, uh, classrooms, um, all, all kinds of places. And this one um, was in, in our Rosedale Library in 2019. And I'm happy to say that as of um, April, we have just begun doing in-person programs again, and it feels great to be out with people. Um, so we're very happy to be doing that. So you can see here from the statistics that we have recorded over 900 oral history interviews since our founding in 2010. We've hosted over 500 live events. I think that this um, residence from 23 countries of origin living in 50 neighborhoods is probably a gross underestimate at this point. Um, but really, in the amount of time that we've been at it, we could have been doing a lot more than 900 oral history interviews. But the reason that it's a relatively lower number is because a big part of our time and energy as a staff has been in an educational part of our mission, where we're really trying to um, train people who are interested in conducting interviews to do um, interviews. And sometimes we see those come back to our collections and sometimes we don't. I mean, sometimes we're helping a graduate student who is going to be doing a thesis project that will involve oral history interviewing and we're an educational resource for them and how to properly conduct oral histories. And then they go and do their project and maybe it doesn't even fit within our collecting. Um, Within our, uh, within our collecting range of it being something to do about Queens, New York. 
Uh, and then sometimes people just do this for their families and they're, they're keeping them. I think that there are a lot of interviews that will probably come back to us at some point, um, but really it's, it's great if people are just seeing us as a resource for process uh, around oral history and, and local history. So this was 2010 was the year that we founded Queen's Memory and it was founded on a collaborative digitization grant provided by the New York Metropolitan Library Council. And it was a collaboration between Queen's College and Queen's Public Library. And that foundation was actually really important for us to provide some kind of a, a base foundation um, on which to build. So it was really useful because it made us um, think about how these two organizations could work together for the first time. And by the end of the first year of um, funding, when, when that expired, we had really a system set up between the two institutions that has continued on to this day. And in this first year of, of funded development, we had three part-time employees, including me, who uh, just did the work of setting up all of the first interviews that, that were conducted. And so the very first interviews uh, were done by me and, and they were all with neighbors of mine who were living in this small neighborhood in Flushing called the Waldheim neighborhood. And Anna Lou Christensen, who's pictured here on the top left as a little girl with her family, um, had lived in this neighborhood for I think 92 of her 93 years. And I interviewed her at the very end of her life and she had wonderful stories to share. And we sat down for multiple sittings and she told me all about the rich history of the neighborhood. She uh, raised a bunch of kids and she was also a teacher herself. So she was really a beloved neighbor and somebody who knew about all of the families. So she was a really wonderful informant to give me uh, a base of who all lived in the, in the neighborhood. And at the end of this year, we had a launch party and we had set up these little listening stations that had audio playing from the first interviews that we had collected. And I found her grown up kids all kind of cuddled around the laptop that was playing their mom's interview clips. And they were emotional, you know, and they said, we realized because their mother had um, passed just recently. She, she passed away before the end of, the, of our first year. Um, they said, we've realized that this is the only recording we have of our mom's voice, and it's just so good to hear her. And I realized at that time that it was going to be a project that was going to have a lot of meaning for, for the people that we worked with, and that this was more than just building an archive. It was really giving families um, some important things that, that they would um, value going forward. So throughout my talk, I have these um, quotes from you know, an anonymous professional, maybe you, maybe me, um, that I thought I would bring out because they're just some of the biggest challenges that we have to face when we're working on projects like this. So if you feel that you can relate to the statement, it's hard to find support for new ideas at my organization. Nothing moves quickly and our culture resists change. I think that you're not alone. I think that um, a lot of organizations, especially if you're working for a large public organization, a big university or a large public library, or even small organizations that are just kind of set in their ways, it can be really hard to move a new project forward. And um, I guess, you know, these are not, <laughs> this is not something that I've solved by any means. But um, I think that over the past decade, it's something that we've had to um, wrestle with. And it's something that um, I have a little insight on in terms of how we've dealt with it at least. And I think that, you know, for us, we've looked at what systems, what um, processes within the organization, what cultural aspects, and sometimes even what individuals are really the cause of things not changing or not moving or change being difficult. And then flipping that and thinking, how can we engage with these processes and systems and colleagues in a way that will make our work um, something that they begin defending in the same way that they're defending the things that um, are not changing now. So how can we become, you know, in our little 
startup project within a larger context and lots of things going on, something that becomes really important to the institution and something that um, becomes kind of locked in um, based on the way that the organization works. So an example of that is that at the beginning of our project, and I was not smart enough to be asking for this, but it's something that happened. <laughs> and I've realized that it's been really helpful since then. Um, we developed, uh, because we were starting Queen's Memory as a grant funded project between these two organizations, um, we developed an, a legal agreement um, that was just a memorandum of understanding, not a really complex document actually, but it was something that was just a very simple and clear statement about whose responsibilities were whose in both institutions. And then both heads of institutions signed it. And now it's a legal agreement that we still go back to and that we amend anytime there is some kind of a shift. Like recently we started um, hosting the queen, the queensmemory.org website at Queens College. And so we changed that in the MOU and it was a good time to just refresh that document and remind everybody um, that the document existed. And, and then it becomes less about you, know, you or me asking a favor to get something to go. Um, and it's more just, you know, me helping to fulfill the promises that our organization has made um, to make this happen. So in 2011, uh, we had, um, I, I moved into a permanent part-time position instead of a temporary part-time position. So I was now a, a one, a one woman Queen's Memory project working part time for both the uh, college and for the library. And we had this donation by Annabelle Short, who did a year long blog project where she was doing interviews with people in a new neighborhood where she and her husband had moved. And she donated all of them in the library's first born digital archival collection. And it just, you know, it doubled our collections. And I think it opened my eyes to how we could really partner with community members to bring excellent content into the collections and that our usefulness as a partner was being a preservation partner somebody you know who would take care of these excellent interviews that this community member had made and make them permanently available to the public so that was really good insight and something that we carried with us throughout the project um, in 2012 um, I became a full-time employee um, and I became a full-time employee with the public library. So the project kind of moved over more to the library um, and was the, the college became a little bit less involved with it. But I still had a lot of great connections at the college and we were beginning to work with faculty members and their students. And so this is one example of a project that we did with a sociology class. They were undergrads and they were interested in studying the way that migration changed the uh, culinary traditions of families living in Queens who had come from other places. So what was ma magic about it was that it's Queens. So all of the students had parents who were immigrants or the students were immigrants themselves. So they had these stories from all over the world, food traditions from all over the world that they were able to talk about. And so um, Athena Varnava was talking about how to make Cypriot um, uh, stuffed grape leaves and gave us that recipe, but then also talked about how the people that she does that cooking with have changed over, the, over time. So this was a really good model to see that we could work with in academic settings. And it was the first time that I had developed guides and pedagogical materials to be able to work with students who um, were new to oral history. And those have been um, developed and redeveloped and we've honed them over the years and into tools that are, I think, pretty useful for people who are approaching oral history for the first time. Um, and so uh, if you find yourself ever saying, but I'm not the boss and I don't have a budget. So um, this was very much the case for Queen's Memory. Um, I still actually don't have a budget for the Queen's Memory project. It's just something that um, we have staff dedicated to, but there's no like programming money that is just accessible to us in a dedicated way every year. So if you find yourself in a position where you're really not the boss, um, what I'd encourage you to do is to find ways to clearly communicate the way that you can be a really good partner to people who you need to make the thing go that you want to do. 
And then um, in terms of not having a budget, the thing that has worked out pretty well for us is doing pilots of, of new initiatives that we wanna try out. So what can be really great about doing a pilot is that even if you're just one person, you can choose a very small version, very small you know, model of what you wanna do. And then you can make your mistakes um, very quickly and, um, and very quietly <laughs> while you mess up the first few rounds. And then once you have some kind of proof of concept that you, you know that you've managed to to finally get to um, through a pilot, then you can uh, leverage that proof of concept into some external funding, have an externally funded project, and then leverage that into um, a, a thing something that's permanently funded. So that is kind of the sequence that we've taken a number of initiatives within the Queen's Memory Project through. Just the idea of doing a low key pilot until we kind of figure out how it needs to work, then getting an out, some outside money and maybe using outside partners. And then once you've demonstrated that success, figuring out a way to make that part of the permanent work of the library and the university. So one um, example of that is that we started doing scanning days in 2013, and we did this right after Hurricane Sandy ripped through New York City and left um, the southern part of Queens, especially um, flooded and damaged. So a lot of people living in Broad Channel and the Rockaways who had experienced a lot of flooding and loss were eager to bring the artifacts that had survived or things that they had managed to, you know, photos that were wrinkly and dried out, but did survive um, into have them scanned with us. So we had a number of scanning days at our broad channel library and at our libraries that are in the Rockaways. And then what we found was that it was really something that there was interest in all over the borough, not just people who had flood damaged things, but a lot of people wanted to get their materials digitized. And then we were able to interact with each person and kind of figure out what they knew about maintaining digital files and maintaining physical artifacts like historic photos and help them to kind of improve the ways that um, they were keeping those materials and keep them safe, whether they were digital or physical. And by this point, we had um, me in a full time position, and then I'd started working with some staff members who were interested in helping out with things like these scanning days. And while it wasn't a part of their official job duties, they became part time employees for the project and began um, helping out with these events and with processing materials. And we started really getting some help, which was really, um, really important that it was not just me. And then in 2014, we were continuing to do some um, partnering work again with Queens Museum. Um, they're a wonderful partner of ours. We've done a ton of different things with them, but this was um, a big anniversary year for the 1939 and 1964 World's Fairs, which so many people attended and they, a lot of people have memorabilia from the fairs. And so they brought those things in to be scanned and just to share short stories with us. So we were doing that recording at the museum. And um, at this time in 2014, I became the coordinator of the metadata services division, which was merged with the group that had been doing um, digitization of our local history materials. So suddenly I had a staff of 30 people, most of which were working on cataloging and um, some of them were working with local history materials. And that gave us excellent resources because there were a lot of people who were less busy than they used to be when the library bought more physical books, but they were um, highly skilled, technical, detail-oriented, had great language skills. The people in metadata services are cataloging books in over 50 languages. And so we had people who could help out. So if we have someone conduct an oral history interview in Korean or in Bangla, then we have somebody who can create a transcript for that interview because we have that language expertise within our full-time staff. So being um, situated now out of the technical services department of the Queens Public Library was really a huge gain, even though most people were not working on Queens Memory stuff at all. It was something that, was, um, that has become increasingly over the years a part of the workflow. And then in 2015, uh, we 
were able to leverage our successes um, with our scanning days that we were just doing in Queens into a citywide project that we did with Brooklyn Public Library and with the Metropolitan New York Library Council. And we were able to launch what it's called the Culture in Transit program. So it was basically taking our methods that we were using to travel around with our scanners and um, codifying those practices and spreading them out over the whole city. So we were able to hire a full-time person, uh, a temporary full-time person, that's, that triangle up in the right corner. Maggie Schreiner was her name. And uh, she's fabulous, still a friend to the Queens Memory Project. And um, she really um, worked on all of the things that we had kind of figured out informally and codified them documented them, created checklists, really came up with great systems for doing the work that we had been doing. And she also reached out to artists like Claro de los Reyes, who's pictured here in the collared shirt that's kind of pink with a um, flyer in front of him. He's a, a teaching artist, somebody who um, owns a theater company and was funded by the Laundromat Project at this time to do a series of events that were community building events across Queens with different Filipino communities, connecting people and hearing people's stories. So we helped him by training him and his team in how to conduct good oral history interviews. And he in turn donated a bunch of really high quality interviews into our collections. And he invited us to his programs. We did collaborative programs together and he remains a, a collaborator with our program today. But it was a really important lesson to work with an artist. And we've really continued doing that since then because artists often give us the most creative ideas about how to engage with people and how to make the work that we're doing really fun for people, which is helpful to get them to show up. So um, it, was, it was great to connect with Claro and with a number of other artists we've worked with over the years. But we run into this project, right? We start projects with temporary staff and resources that we don't have the capacity to support in the long run. Now, I, I'm imagining that, that many of you can relate to this problem. You get something started, community members get excited about it, and then the funding ends, and then there you are, maybe even just one staff person trying to figure out how to continue something that you don't have the capacity to continue. So this is an ongoing problem, something that we have not solved yet. Grant funding comes and goes. Usually it funds projects and not long-term initiatives. And so you just end up having these, you know, these temporary times where you have resources to do things. So the, the one thing that we have figured out over time is just to be really clear and honest with community members about how long your funding lasts and what you can do with them during the time that you have a certain project going. And I think that that, really plays into a larger idea about how to engage with community members or with an informant when you're doing oral history practices. So the idea is that you're a partner with the person that you're interviewing and they're in on it with you and you're figuring out together how you're going to do this, this thing that you both wanna do. So I think that you know bringing people into it and really letting them know what the situation is has, has probably been the most helpful thing. And we really experienced this at this time. And in 2016, we had um, the very wonderful Yingwen Huang, who is pictured in the middle here with the striped shirt. She was a temporary employee with us um, conducting oral histories in Mandarin and Korean and running scanning days in those languages with people all over Queens and collecting really incredible records for our collections and conducting interviews in languages that we just don't have the capacity to do even, even now. So we made clear to people, look, we have Ying for this amount of time, so sign up for your interview now. <laughs> and 2016 was also a really important year because we got our first full-time employee on the Queen's Memory Project. So I've been counting myself as a full-time employee, but I was also running a cataloging division and a lot of other stuff going on. But Richard Lee, who's pictured in the top right here, was um, our first person who was really um, a project coordinator and he was just full-time on Queen's Memory, which was something that we had not had before. And it made a huge difference just in terms of having somebody who could be in constant contact with people. And then we still at this time had Maggie on doing culture and transit. And we also had Ying on doing the project that we're doing with her, which is called Memories of Migration. 
And then in 2017, we lost both of our wonderful um, uh, temporary employees, but they left us uh, enriched with all of the resources and materials that they had gathered. And we started an unfunded project. And this was the first time that we had done a really just thematic project before. Um, we wanted to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Queen's Pride Parade. And because it was still pretty recent history, we were able to connect with the people who had founded the parade, the parade originally and talk with some of those original organizers. And then we were able to also talk with next generation organizers and activists who were able to tell us about what issues they were facing today and how things have changed in that 25 years in Queens. So um, we also were able to, through this project, attract um, a couple of volunteers who have been with us since this time, who were coming to us more because of their interest in um, being LGBTQ activists than they were in oral history. And so it was a good eye opener that, you know, you can get people sometimes to contribute to your work, sometimes through an interest in a topic more than through an interest in libraries and archives and history and um, oral history. And then um, in 2018, we did yet another unfunded pilot. We had um, the wonderful volunteer, Adrian Lara, who's pictured here in the far left, who single-handedly dug through our oral history collections and produced a 10 episode uh, podcast season that was about people's migration stories from other places to Queens. And um, she also, was the first person who came up with the idea of having live listening and talkback events for each one of our episodes. So with every episode that we published, we would have a live event that would feature people who had, whose voices had been featured in the episode. So like, for example, um, at this event that was held at the Jackson Heights Library, we had Tara Madatherty, who is in the white jacket and sitting next to her, Luna Ranjit, who had, uh, is the founder of Adhikar, who were both featured in um, the episode and then they came and they were able to bring their families and friends and audience members were able to ask them questions about their experiences, things that exceeded what we were able to put into the podcast episode. And we are um, right now, and I'll talk more about it later, launching our third season now of the Queen's Memory podcast and we've continued this tradition of having live events and they're, they're really great. So in 2019, we had a kind of um, return or like a turning inwards kind of time. We were able to add a third um, full-time staff member. So it was, um, we were able to add a community coordinator. So this person is not responsible for doing any archival processing. She is, is strictly in charge of outreach to volunteers, training people, um, reaching out to community. And um, we added her like December of 2019. And we also um, were fortunate enough that on the Queens College side, our co longtime colleague who had actually been with us at the very beginning of the Queens Memory Project, Annie Tumino, who's pictured here standing in front of the, um, with, with pictures in front of that TV, she became the head of special collections and archives at Queens College Libraries. So she, was a great ally who began to wake up Queens College and get them more involved and have you know more things that the college began really doing to contribute to the Queens Memory Project again. And so now, like I say, you know they're hosting our website. We're um, engaging with students in a in a much more rigorous way. It's really amazing to have um, an active partner at the college. And then we also began our ambassadors program, which was um, a staff, like an internal staff program at Queens Public Library, where we train people who are in um, working in our branches in public service roles to be able to conduct Queens Memory live events, to be able to train volunteers on how to conduct oral history interviews and do interviews themselves. So that it's not always just like the three people who are working on Queen's Memory at the Central Library who are conducting every program. And that way we're able to really leverage their great relationships with the communities that they serve every day. And so this program was really able to take off when we added Merrill, our community coordinator to our staff, because she's really their point of contact and the person who's teaching them these great skills. So what can happen sometimes is that all these wonderful grant funded projects and collaborators coming from all these different directions can, um, can 
just steer you away from the the main point of your work. It, it can very easily happen that you go down a rabbit hole of a grant funded project and you kind of get away from the main point. So what was really nice in 2019 that we had started doing was a kind of coming back to what our main point should be. And if we have a team in place, we wanted them to not be distracted. We wanted you know to figure out what we really wanted to focus on. And so in January of 2020, um, not knowing what was coming, uh, we had a visioning day, which was really inspiring. So this was led by Lee Kim, who's in front, and Dan Toyama, who's on the far right side uh, from the Design Dream Lab. It's a design thinking, uh, design thinking think tank. And um, they led us through a Lego serious play day of visioning with our team. And our team consisted of administrators, um, librarians, staff from the college, scholars, um, people doing things like running our volunteer services department, also our volunteers, um, people who had participated in the Queen's Memory Project as interviewers and as people who were interviewed. So we really brought together every possible stakeholder within Queen's Memory and brought them all together to meet each other uh, and then also to think deeply about Queen's Memory for a day. And I'm just going to share with you the kind of um, chain of activities that we did through that day. So getting people started with Lego serious play. It's something to like Google if you wanna look at this practice. Um, it's, a, it's like giving adults Legos and having them build ideas with the Legos. So first um, you just get people's hands familiar with using Legos again, because most of us haven't done this since we were little. So you have them one, build a tower. Then two, you build how you're feeling. So then you kind of begin to understand that what you're building is not a physical thing, but you're building ideas. And then you begin launching into deeper questions. Build what Queen's memory means to you. Build what you value about Queen's memory. All of these activities are taking place at, I think we had five tables where we had five to six participants all kind of working together at the table and sharing Legos. So they, they're building their individual things. Then um, you build a shared model of what you and your teammates value about Queen's memory. So at this point, they combined their different things that they had built and they begin sharing what they were thinking about and building something together that's a shared model. Then back to an individual activity, they build their superpower that they're bringing to the project. So what is it that, that they alone can contribute better than anybody else that they're going to offer to Queen's memory? And then the last thing that we asked people to do was to work together as a group to complete the sentence in 2100 um, queen's memory will be known as blank build a shared model of what you want queen's memory legacy to be so for me as the founder of this program it was super inspiring just to see how many people cared and how many people really got it too like really understood the the heart and um, the purpose behind this work that we're doing. So it was, it was lovely um, just to see all these people get together and express their thoughts about Queen's memory. And then the takeaways that we got from this day, I think are worth sharing. And you can see on the left, some of the things that people built, uh, they're really fun to look at. But number one, the the number one takeaway was that preserving the stories from diverse backgrounds that truly represent Queens is at the heart of Queens memory. It will serve as a, the portal into the past for the future generation. So this was really good for me to see because it really got back to the oral histories, got back to the collecting. And I saw that us having public programs was really, it needed to all be in service of these collections and of developing and preserving these collections. And so that was a really grounding thing to see as a number one takeaway from everybody. Then two, um, that digital preservation and new technology infrastructure would be essential parts of the future of Queen's memory. So we have some technology issues. We have some poor platforms on which we're trying to share things. It's a struggle. So this was good to see that this is our main challenge that we really need to be working on. And then third, uh, expertise 
meaning systems, workflows, and infrastructure built through Queen's memory for oral history are something exemplary. So this was really, I mean, it was nice to hear, but it was also nice to know that the documentation that we had been creating and sharing were actually useful to people. And we were really hearing this from scholars who are working a lot of times with students and also seeing what is published out there in the field. And they were letting us know that the things that we are sharing about Queen's memory are not always shared um, as, as widely as what we do. And that it's really part of our mission to be doing this, this education piece and that that's something we need to be careful to really retain in our practices. So these were great takeaways and I found them really helpful even through the crazy times that were about to come because you know what happens next. That was January of 2020. And so in by March, we had completely um, upended all of our in-person practices and we had launched what we called the COVID-19 project which is an online project that was built with our technology partners, Urban Archive. So we have an interactive map of Queens and we have um, submission forms that people can use and we set them up in a bunch of different languages and people could just share their photographs, share their stories, sometimes written, sometimes audio, sometimes video. And people just came out of the woodwork for this as volunteers. They came out of the woodwork for this as people contributing stories. People contributed beautiful stuff that was documenting the moment of the pandemic. And it was the first time that we had focused on a project that was really something so contemporary and something not only thematic, but um, without history, something that is just documenting a present moment. Uh, but it was great because we, with the help of our community coordinator, Meryl, um, we set up an Instagram account that attracted a whole new generation of volunteers to help us out. We also got some you know, emergency relief kind of um, grant money that allowed us to hire a whole team of people to create a second season of our podcast, which we featured entirely the materials that had come in through the COVID-19 project and really had stories that were about the pandemic. So it was actually a transformational in a good way, crazy good way. Um, the, the pandemic was a, a a positive, there were positive outcomes from, um, from that time. And we did see the program grow in, in positive ways. And we were really happy that we had the basic foundations of our program in place so that we could scale quickly and be of service to our community. Because let me tell you, in March of, of 2020, Queens was the epicenter of the epicenter. And everybody here, when we listen back to the interviews, it's just ambulances in the background. And it was just a, it was an upside down world. So let's go back to some of those visioning day um, key takeaways and, and what we've done about those things. So the first one, if you'll remember, was really about oral history and about how the collections were really primary. So what we've done in the time since that visioning day is to really double down on our oral history. So we've, we've, we offer now regularly scheduled free trainings each month that, that anybody can attend. And we've also, um, for the first time, we're, we're piloting the idea of commissioning oral history, uh, oral historians. And so we have a thematic project that's about uh, female identifying activists living in Queens and wanting to find an interviewer who we pay um, a flat fee to conduct 10 interviews with, you know, with people who are female identifying activists. And those interviews are happening right now. It seems to be, I mean, it was a very successful uh, job posting and that we had dozens and dozens of people who wanted to participate in this role as a paid oral historian. So in that sense, it was very successful and we'll see at the conclusion of this. Um, but I think that the interviews that we create are going to be very successful. And then we also have really um, shared out featured oral history content through social media. So like you see in the top right corner here, featured oral history, we're, we're doing this through Instagram and also through our website to make sure that we keep the oral histories really front and center in what we're doing. Then the second point, if you'll remember, was really about our technology challenges and how we need to revamp things and get them working better for us. So 
there is right now a consultant led discovery phase um, going on for a new digital asset management system, not only for us, but also for our partners in the marketing division and in the archives. So we're trying to get stakeholder meetings with this consultant with people across the organization to find a back end system that's going to be helpful to all of us, and not just to digital archives, but that will also lead to new front end solutions that will be better for public access than what we have right Right now. So with the help of our foundation, who is really helping us not just with a shiny new project, but with something that is foundational, we're able to work with these consultants to come up with a great um, infrastructure and preservation um, infrastructure for our materials. And then lastly, you know, the, the third point was really about our educational part of our mission and how, you know, our documentation is actually useful to people. So during the pandemic, we were um, able to have staff in our division who would normally be working the physical scanners who just were not in the office um, to learn WordPress and create a new website for Queen's Memory. So we now have this beautiful new website. I would encourage all of you to uh, check it out. It's queensmemory.org. And we were able to build out our project reports, which, which really detail who we were working with, what our goals were, what we figured out, what the challenges were, and then um, any kind of resources that we developed through different projects that we want to share out. And so we also have a bunch of different guides that we publish on our website that are like interviewer guides for people and that kind of thing. So we've tried to be really uh, consistent and, and updating these materials that we're sharing with the public. And then in, in 2021, uh, we hired this big old team to be able to produce the third season of our podcast, which is um, uh, funded by an NEH grant. Um, we were able to add a new um, part-time position that's our Queen's Memory Curator. And we, uh, we looked inward again to do projects that really linked us closely with the marketing division, the library had its 125th anniversary. And so we've launched a staff interviewing project that is to, meant to really capture a lot of institutional history in the library. And it's been a nice promotional tool for Queen's Memory too, just internal awareness about what Queen's Memory is because staff members are competing every month for uh, one day of um, extra vacation um, for the best interview that's submitted that month. So we're really getting some some help from our internal partners, as well as, you know, just funding to be able to support honoraria for presenters that we are having in our public programs. So we're getting a lot more of a foothold within our big institution than what we've ever had before. And lastly, I'll, I'll end here with um, the launch of our new podcast. Um, if you go to queensmemory.org slash podcast, you can see links to where you can subscribe to it wherever you listen to podcasts. And we were able to hire um, this incredible team. So the, the theme of the podcast this year, it, the title is called um, Our Major Minor Voices, and it focuses on Asian communities in Queens. And we have the episodes in uh, eight different Asian languages, as well as English. So we brought in all of these bilingual producers who have been really excited to share stories from their communities and to bring those stories into our archives. Because every podcast season that we do, all of the full interviews um, that, you know, in addition to the things that make the cut into the episode for the podcast, the full interviews come into our archival collections. So we're increasing our archival collections in languages like Tagalog and Korean and Nepali and Tibetan, all you know, the languages that we really just didn't have before. So we're thrilled uh, to be able to do that. And then we just started a new project um, that will launch publicly in July that is about name places in Queens. So it's going to be an interactive map that will um, show every 
place, like if it's a street or a school um, or a park or a playground that's named after an individual person and who that person is. So a biography of that person and hopefully some archival records of that person. So maybe a photograph or um, some kind of a document or a clipping from a paper or something like that. So that's the thing that we are just starting to work on right now. And that concludes my talk. I'm, I'm hoping that there might be some questions. Thank you so much for your time and attention. All right, well, let's just jump right into the Q&A now because we already have one question in the chat. Um, what does your free oral history training look like? Sure, so we have two very regular trainings that Merrill runs, they're both virtual. At this point, we might go back to in person. Um, but one of them is just an onboarding for new volunteers. So that is a very basic uh, training in how to, if you want to go out and capture an interview, like here's the consent form you need to use. Here are some you know basics on how to capture a good interview, kind of the nuts and bolts of how to participate with Queen's Memory. And then the other regular training that we provide is an hour long training that goes more deeply into the oral history interviewing part of it. So how to ask good questions, um, how to conduct a successful pre-interview meeting that will lead to a more successful oral history interview, how to um, manage the files afterwards and, and where to send them. So it gets a little bit more deeply into the interviewing part of oral history and also some of the um, methodological um, underpinnings of, of oral history, like some of the concepts and ideas behind oral history. And so if you go to uh, queensmemory.org slash um, events, um, you'll see they're, they're regularly on our upcoming events schedule and you can come to any of them for free. And we also have a number of trainings that we do on campus at Queens College. So our um, outreach coordinator at Queens College, her name is uh, Laura uh, Lori Wallach, and she uh, has been with us, I mean, since like 20 14 or something and she works with professors and students a lot and trains them in how to do good interviews. So this next question is a two-parter. Can you talk about how Urban Archives worked with you and what services did they provide? Sure, so they um, have a interactive map of New York City and we started working with them because we were using them as a place to build our walking tours. So we have a number of walking tours that are posted on Urban Archive that just show you a particular neighborhood, historic pictures of it so that you can walk around and see what's there now and you can match it up with the historic photo that's pinned to the you know, specific places. And then when um, the pandemic started, we knew that we needed to very, very quickly launch a project that would have an interactive map and the capacity to, to crowdsource. And so we knew that they would be able to do a beautiful job with that. And they very generously built a project page for us for the COVID-19 project um, that did just exactly what we needed. And, and then I, I was behind the scenes furiously trying to get grant money to like back pay them for work that they had done for us. And we were able to, to do that. So they took a real leap of faith with us, which I appreciate. But, but basically, you know, what, what they do for us is to uh, locate our assets on a map that people can either use their phone or a computer to find. And that it's easy for people to submit their materials through the Urban Archive platform. Can you share a bit more about the development of your website? Sure. So um, we just uh, worked basically, um, you know, over Slack. Um, me and uh, Grace DeSagan is the staff member who created the website, and she um, built it, and it was hosted for a while. Um, on the servers of the tech incubator at Queens College, and then moved over to the servers at the Rosenthal Library. And there's a um, librarian um, who is maintaining the site now and who is our system 
admin person working on the site. So we just basically like built out via documents, like what copy and what pictures we, we wanted. You know, we kind of created our, our wireframes uh, just in a pretty informal way. And then Grace built it and she figured out ways to make, you know, embed media. Um, we also use um, Aviary to display our audio visual archival materials. And Aviary is a really great, really great tool because it's really built for oral histories and has wonderful ways to exhibit um, um, encoded transcripts so that you can jump around in the text and it will it's it's in sync with the audio and video and it has really good embed options so we're able to embed our different oral histories and recorded public programs etc into our website one resource at a time so that was a big part of building the new website was making sure that we could embed you know like a featured oral history that changes up i think we change it every two weeks and our next question is another two-parter do you transcribe all of your interviews and podcasts and do you do the transcribing yourselves or outsource it? We do now. We didn't used to. Uh, when we first started Queen's Memory, what I found pretty quickly was that it was overwhelming to volunteer interviewers once it got to the transcript part. Um, I found that people just they didn't have the bandwidth for it like it was it's it's a lot already to ask somebody to do a pre-interview meeting with the person they're going to interview and then to record an interview with them maybe even to record a second session and then to get all those files and a signed consent form delivered to us like that people pretty much like tap out at that point and so when we were expecting them to create really big like transcripts it was just more than what folks could really do so what we did instead was we had um indexes which we called um time code outlines so what we asked for and sometimes what we just did instead because the volunteer interviewer just you know couldn't do it um was to just have time code stamps and then a description of what was happening at that time and we tried to just fill those with as many good access points as we could. We put in as many proper names as we could, tried to make them really good uh, search doc searchable documents. Um, but but um, at some point we realized that the technology had advanced with automated transcription services so that it was not taking longer to do than um, a content outline. So we also were really interested in the um, ADA accessibility kind of aspect of having a, a full transcript. I mean, it is better to have a full transcript. It was just something we we didn't have the capacity to do before. So now we use um, we've used Trint as an automated transcription generator, and now we're using Rev. Um, both products are good. Um, Rev is working better for us because we needed to be able to run um, an interview through generate an automated transcript and then send it out to a volunteer. And we have these farmed out to dozens of people. And some of our volunteers just do this kind of back office work with us and they just work on transcripts. And some people are more interested in the more like social butterfly, I wanna interview lots of people kind of work. And so what we're finding more and more is that people are kind of more comfortable with one thing or the other. And, um, you know, Rev is definitely not perfect, but but the um, the way that you're able to edit um, edit it and and listen to the audio and clean it up makes it a, a doable process. Um, something that we we found um, that we found manageable. And we have a follow up about the urban archives question from earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this seems like it's more of just a clarification. So if someone clicks on the map, they'll hear an audio recording of someone talking about that store or monument or whatever it might be, correct? Yeah, so the, the COVID, so most of our content that is on urban archive is visual content. So it's mostly historic photos of a place pinned to the map location of that place. But um, 
we now have through the COVID-19 project, we sometimes link out to audio that is a, an audio recording from somebody who contributed their, their story. And through the, the monuments project that we're doing, that's like the named places in Queens project, um, that one is probably going to be mostly visual materials too. Though if somebody records a story about um, that, that person, um, maybe it's somebody that they, they knew, uh, or maybe they have a particular memory of that place, then we'll be able to, to link out um, to that um, audio or video. But there's not a player within Urban Archive. It's more built for like photographs and then um, for text that's about the, the, the place. All right, and it looks like that was our last question. So I'm Great. just gonna throw a quick plug in. If you folks would like to learn more about Queen's Memory, we're actually going to be doing another webinar in June, June 1st with Merrill, who's going to be talking about volunteer management. Um, so I'm gonna drop the link for that into the chat box and you can find more information about that program as well as all of our other upcoming educational programs at dhpsny.org slash education. So thank you, Natalie, for such a fantastic presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Um, thanks again. Bye. Thanks, everybody.